Shalom. How you doing? Gonna have some uh dialect. Maybe I'll get closer so I can actually read you guys' stuff. There we go. Cause I, I definitely want to have some open dialogue these next couple of days. We got about three more minutes. I try to load up five minutes prior to uh, let people see that we're on. We'll get started. Hopefully they get on on time. All you people out there, can you just type Shalom so I can see? For some reason, I can't see who's on or how many people's watching. So I try to wait before I get into the scriptures because most of the time I'm super fast paced. And... Um, it only takes five minutes to not know where we're at, you know, five, ten minutes. You missing a couple of scriptures, you know, you'll be kind of lost in the sauce for a bit until you catch up. Shalom, everyone. Hey, so I got something to ask you guys. Um, these next couple of days, I do want to hear some input. So I'm going to be reading uh, what you guys say. And any topics uh, related to the subject, definitely bring up. Any disagreements uh, related to the topic, uh, definitely bring up. And we're we're all about discussing this. Uh, a lot of today, tomorrow, uh, the five days in between the regular Sabbath for the Feast of Tabernacle, we're going to be dealing. I want to deal with real life things. Uh, you know, I'm big on not uh, ranting um, because I went to a congregation and the minister will say one scripture and go. 20 30 minutes and and sometimes tell stories that don't even have to do with the topic and he forgets and then the whole time he used three scriptures and it's like what kind of edification we got at three scriptures so you know me i think last time we used like 17 scriptures i try to at least get 10 12 scriptures and that's already like 45 minutes when we're getting into a topic uh but uh, there are things to where we take the entirety of the bible and we deal with subjects, there might be a scripture. Is that squirrel going to attack me? Oh, okay. There's like two squirrels fighting. He ran like right at me. He was like, oh, I'm swole too. But anyways, so um, in life, there's not always a concrete scriptures that helps you with your scenario. And so we have to take the entirety of the Bible. Uh, a prime example is... When you say, hey, uh, you know, uh, if a man committed, oh, your wife committed adultery, I, I, I challenge these men. And I want you guys to give me input. I challenge these men. I said, hey, if, you're, if your wife um, uh, cheated on you, would you put her away? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would. And I said, if you cheated on your wife and you felt bad and you came to her, and you want her to take you back. Would you want her to take you back? And they're like, yeah. I was like, well, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. And they're like, well, you know. And there's only one guy that was actually honest. And he said, um, I will want her to take her back. But I will understand if she didn't take me back. And so he held her at the same accountability as he held himself. And there was only one person. But the most the majority of the time, people were hypocrites. Uh, some people want their wife to commit adultery just so they could find someone new because um, they're unhappy in their marriage. But the entirety of the Bible, meaning the perfect will are finding the, the most accurate will of the Bible because there's acceptable and perfect will of God. And I can show you scriptures if you guys want me to. But if your wife came to you and she cheated one time and she came to you, and say, hey, I cheated on you, meaning you didn't catch her. She wasn't trying to hide her sin. She actually felt bad and repented. And she came to you and say, hey, I messed up. Or if your husband, hey, I messed up. I did it one time. I felt bad. I'm coming to you because I want to be honest with you. And I repent. And hopefully you take me back. Now, you had no idea that husband or that wife could have easily got away with it and just didn't do it no more. Felt bad, didn't do it no more and just didn't tell you. But they had a godly sorrow and came to you. Now, 
by law, you can put her or him away and go get a new one. By law, you can. But the entirety of the Bible of um, reconciliation and the perfect will of the Almighty of Yah, he put Israel away. He put Judah away. He divorced in Jeremiah. He divorced Israel. Did he go and reconcile with a different nationality? No, he didn't. He came back to his own people and remarried his own people under a new, uh, uh, new covenant. So I would say to any man, yes, you by law, you can put her away. But the perfect will of the almighty, him or her away. But the entirety of the Bible of reconciliation and man broke communion in the garden with the almighty. And he sent his son to reconcile the world to himself is for you to take her back. Now, when he took Israel back, it was under a new covenant and it got tighter. Now, I say when you look at a woman, you commit adultery in the heart. If you hate your brother without cause, if you say to your brother, thou fool, he made it tighter in the new covenant. So if you came and said, all right, I'll take you back. No more Facebook. You're done. You're done with Facebook. All oh, man, the new covenant you make. OK, if we going to work this out, we, we it's, it's not it's going to be tighter, just like the new covenant It's tighter. He deals with the heart. He, he's real tight in the new covenant. And so um, the subjects we're going to deal these next three days, these next four days are going to be dealing with things of the heart and dealing with things that happen in our everyday life. And and um, so, yes, I am not going to use as much scriptures because there's not pinpoint scriptures in regards to some of these things. We are going to hit a couple of scriptures, like three or four today. But I really want to challenge you guys for cognitive. There we go. Thinking. There we go. And and I want you I want to hear some input. I want to hear some uh, output. We serve the almighty, but we also go through real things. You know, we don't get the burning bush that Moses got. We don't get to see an angel come and destroy 185,000 of our enemies. The enemies on our job site is there every day, 40 hours a week. You know, so um, let's get into the book. Uh, uh, fingers do the, okay, all right. He, she's, she's talking. Hey, just let the fingers do the talking. Okay. All right. All right. Someone's telling me to hurry up. I will. So with all this, uh, um, welcome to True Hebrews United. I'm chilling under the boot. Welcome to True Hebrews United. <laughs> True Hebrews United. Is someone trying to say hurry up and get into the scriptures to me? But welcome to True Hebrews United. Um, this should be love. I forgot. Teacher Simon. I forgot what I was going to say. Holiness instructor, disciples of Joe Sergeant, Teacher Simon. About to get into the book as usual. Definitely give all honor to the Almighty Yah, the Creator of all things, through His Son Yeshua Mashiach. Definitely all uh, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, the elders, the bishops, the deacons out there that's pushing the, uh, in the trenches, pushing the line and compelling people to repent from their sins. Definitely all the brothers and sisters keeping his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, his precepts and his ways. All the people trying to get into the body. If it's in the book and it's rightly divided, then you obey it. Make those steps. He says, draw nine to me and I'll draw nine to you. Make those steps to salvation. In Yeshua's name. Um, all the people that watch and subscribe or follow and uh, on the Facebook or uh, YouTube, I appreciate you guys. I want you guys to do what it takes to be saved and to make it into the kingdom. So um, definitely uh, uh, all, all that. There's something else I was going to say. Any more shout outs? No. So with all that said and being done, let's let the fingers do the walking and the scriptures do the talk. Okay. Someone trying to tell me to hurry up. All right, I got you. I got you. Don't trip. One day, one day I talk just a little bit, and all of a sudden I'm falling off. Well, let's get it. All right, let's get into the scriptures. Give me Isaiah. Chapter 26, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. So we're going to be dealing with stress today. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Let's get it. It says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, 
whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Okay, so when someone's going through a death in the family or um, some kind of stress on their life, we can easily quote this scripture to them. We can easily send this through a text message. And this is a prime example how, yes, we have a scripture that will keep them in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon them. But certain things with financial situations, that burden is still there. Uh, when you still, yes, we trust in the Almighty, but you still don't have gas in your tank to get to work. Or, yes, you still don't have a babysitter. Or, you're still dealing with certain things. That stress it does not disappear. But we have trust to know we will get through the storm. And so we're dealing with stress until we get to the storm, until the deliverance comes from the most high, until a uh, doorway opens, until that stress is removed. We still need to deal with that. And this is where the entirety of the Bible comes in, because that scripture. Will keep us in peace like, OK, I'm cool, but the next day I still got to deal with this garbage worker. Yeah, but I'm peace with almighty, but that stress is still there. So let's get another scripture. Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. It says, follow peace with all man and holiness without which no man shall see the almighty. So we're supposed to follow peace. And we do things that provoke peace or to initiate peace. And uh, I'm going to show you one more scripture. This mad wild animal is out today. One more scripture. Uh, give me Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it be possible, as much that life in you be peaceable with all men. Now, keep in mind, uh, no matter how much we want peace, some people don't want peace. No matter how much I want peace with a uh, European, if he's racist, he's racist. There will be no peace. You know, there's times where he says, don't seek peace of these nations. He says, don't make a covenant with them. And um, we try our best to seek peace, but sometimes they don't want peace and so if they want war then so be it you establish the relationship that's how i look at it is i let every man establish the relationship i'm going to come peaceably with me with you but if you want to gossip backbite talk trash and you want war then i'm more than willing for war it's it's no problem uh it's not an issue for me i'm well acquainted with contention and being at war with people but i do seek peace like they say seek peace but train for war or whatnot so these scriptures we're supposed to be seeking peace and that counteracts stress so i want to deal with some topics that i want to get your input on some of these things and i'm, I'm gonna be reading reading your guys's uh questions me that was you know, something come on dad something something scriptures do the talking amen are you scared of the wild animals? <laughs> no, this squirrel <laughs> ran right at me. I'm not scared. If it was a dog, I could punch a dog, but squirrels are kind of small. So, like, how are you going to really, like, you know, grab it midair? If it jumps at you, you just grab it midair. While it's, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe. I'm not square, scared of the squirrel in and of itself. This little bite will make give me two or three stitches. That's like, nothing. But I definitely don't want to get bit in my face you know i gotta still stay good looking and whatnot so i'm gonna deal with something let's let's deal with the main things that stress us out let's deal with uh children all right so uh whether it's disobedient children whether it's children with this uh disabilities that is a stress on you i find without me messing up tomorrow's message or the message afterwards i find that uh there's two ways to deal with stress most people they will deal with the problem and live with the problem versus find the solution. And later on, tomorrow will be your good years. And after that, uh, the day after that, I'll be teaching about being an overcomer. So I'm not going to get too much into that. But a prime example is uh, you'll find two people. And they're like, man, this doorknob, dude. Every time we walk through this door, whether they're on the job or whether in your house, 
this doorknob should just jam, dude. It, you got to force it open or force it shut. And week one, week two, week three goes by, and you guys will just deal with the problem. But few people will say, you know what, I'm going to go to Home Depot and buy another doorknob and I'm going to replace this door. Or I'm going to take this apart and figure out why this doorknob is messed up. And that's the mindset people have with stress. They will tend to have this stress and deal with it than to solve the problem to alleviate stress. And a perfect example, I told you guys about this guy on the job site I was working with and I... I wanted to just quit, but I'm waiting for my other company, my boys, so I could roll with them and start working. So I'm dealing with this guy and I'm doing he's you know, I'm he's having me do all the garbage work. And then he's just chilling back, uh, not doing barely anything. And then he's getting all they'll come to him. Oh, good job, man. You're doing a good job. And, and, and it's like I'm doing 80 percent of the work. I'd rather work by myself and get all the credit to me than work with this guy. And so I'm dealing with certain things like smog, like, dude, I got to get this car to pass smog. This is kind of garbage. The check engine light cut back on. I thought I fixed it. Man, I ain't trying to get, you know what I'm saying? Just, just, that's just something minor, but just other things in life I'm dealing with. And I don't want to come and deal with someone for eight hours who's getting on my nerves that we get in disagreements and arguments because he, I don't know what's on his mind. So I started thinking while I'm on this ladder, all the things that stress me out. And I said, what can I take off my plate? I was like, I'm going to go deal with this dude. So the week before I went to the foreman and I said, hey, man, can you switch us up because we don't get along? And he knows that I'm a hustler. So he didn't want to separate us. He didn't want to say, oh, well, you sure he speak highly of you and oh, you guys are a good team. So he wasn't trying to separate us. So I went to the dude and I said, hey, check this out, man. And then even if he was, I didn't feel right within myself as a man of me just telling the foreman and the foreman separates us and he doesn't even know why. And say word gets back like, yeah, Simon didn't want to work with you. And then he would have been like, man, that's Simon. Got, why didn't Simon just come and tell me? So as a man, I didn't feel right. I felt I should go to that other man and tell him what's up. So I went to him. I said, hey, man, we've been working. We're not a good team. We don't work good together. And we're going to separate. And I've already talked to the foreman about it. And I was like, he's like, oh, I thought we did. And in my mind, yeah, of course you thought we did because I'm doing all the work. Of course, of course you would say that because you're in a position of power where you get all the credit and I do all the work. Of course you would say, I thought we make a good partner. Yeah, I would say that too if, it, if the tables were turned. Yeah, so uh, it went back to him. And so the foreman came, oh, what's up? How are you doing trying to fish? I said, hey, when are you going to separate me? I already talked to him. And then he's like, oh, yeah, you know, you made it kind of awkward now. And I was going to do it. And he wasn't going to do it. You know what I'm saying? I was going to do it. But, you know, go ahead and work. And he switched us out. So then the next day, I try to say, what's up to him? He just ignored me. So I was like, and then they're like, maybe he didn't hear you. I tried to wave it. The guy didn't even want to talk to me. And, and I don't, I'm not pulling a race card, but the guy was European. And I've noticed dealing with a lot of Europeans, not all of them, because some of my best friends are Europeans. They are cool with Hebrews, as long as you're docile, obedient, this, but whenever you stand up for right, they don't want nothing to do with you, you nigger, you coon, that, that's pretty much how it is, so as long as I was doing all the work, and you getting all the glory, man, me and Simon's cool, oh, Simon's cool, but as soon as I said, man, we don't work, I want to get my own glory, I want to show my own skill set, and my own craftsman set, and we're going to work, and if we're going to be two journeymen, then A, it should be equal, then all of a sudden you don't want nothing to do with me. Of course not, because that's that slave master mentality. Uh, just like when you had a good slave and that white man was going to die, he wants that good slave. He he don't want that slave to want his freedom. He want that slave to be his son's slave. Man, you're a good slave. I want you to be a son. You keep him. He, don't sell him. He's he's a good slave. And same thing. It's like, nah, dude, nah. But if that, that day that slave wants his freedom, oh, who are you? This and this and this. Now he wants nothing to do with that slave. And so it's like, I'm used to this, man. It, it, I've been doing this and working in the trade for so long. That the stuff don't even bother me. You know what I'm saying? I. But every day after that, it's been stress-free. I don't have to spend eight, 40 hours a week dealing with this knucklehead. And I just took stress off my plate. I just dealt with it. I am not going to not deal. With, I solved the problem. I'm not going to continue to deal with this. I was dealing with it for a couple of weeks and I'm bringing this back to dealing with stress. I was dealing with it for a couple of weeks because I know I was jumping companies, but I'm like, man, I don't know when he's going to give me the call so I can make the jump, and put my week notice in. So let me just alleviate this right now. And it's been peaceful. And I'm saying that to bring this back to stress with uh, children or dealing with children is 
you have a child that is uh, disobedient or say hyperactive disorder, supposedly, or whatever. And you're like, man, what am I going to do with this child? And you keep dealing with it. But some of the things is you need to solve the problem to get the stress out. If you change the child's diet and you take a lot of sugar out of this diet and, and out of their diet and you there for the first two weeks, they're going to go through some withdrawals. OK, let me hear you. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is true. Uh, she said something right. So then if you change the child's diet, right, um, they'll the first two weeks, they're going to go through their sugar withdrawals because you're probably feeding them too much junk food. And you're going to notice a change in their behavior. It is proven a diet dictates behavior. Have you ever been hungry and you get irritable? That's scientific proven. You know, then once you get some glucose in your system, your mood changes and you're good. Um, so uh, there was uh, my mom's, oh, pretty much my uh, niece. They said she had hyperactive disorder. All she did was take sugar out of her diet and gave her healthy things like granola bars or yogurt or some a pineapple or mango or whatnot. But none of the sugar. And she was cool and calm and collective and was able to pay attention and everything. Sometimes. We rely too much on prayer, which you should, but prayer, faith with works. We pray for a situation because this is stressing us out. We almighty help me with this situation. Help me with that situation. But what works are we putting with it? Uh, this is another one. If you want to change a kid's behavior, change their diet and you'll see a difference. I'm telling you, you'll see a difference. Another situation is. Tire them out, tire them out. If, if you know you want a peaceful day, take them to the pool. Have you ever took a kid to a pool? What happens? They, they probably sleeping on the car ride home. Right when they get to the house. Buy a little temporary pool in your backyard, wherever, and tire these little kids out. If they stressing you out, take them to the park and let them relieve all that stuff. And make sure you take the sugar out so they don't have the extra energy. Have them healthy lunch. Take them to a park and you just run. Go ahead. Oh, I'm tired. Here's something to drink. Get back on the slide. Tired. So when you get home and the time you want to study or the time you want peace, bam, you know, find some, maybe they're getting on your nerves because you don't take them to the park as much as you should. Maybe you, you know, what are you doing to take that stress out? What is your situation? Another scenario, change your disciplinary measure. Uh, what I like to do. Uh, we smoke the children. Uh, what we'll do is we'll be like, man, get in the push-up position. Start doing push-ups. And right when they're, oh, I'm tired, flutter kicks. They start doing flutter kicks. You know what they feel. Hold on, you can't see. The flutter kicks. Start doing jumping jacks. Start doing uh, whatever. We just keep them busy for 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and we tire them out. We wear them out. Not every time you have to give them a spanking because it's not a sin. He says use the right of correction that they sin not. So a lie, automatic spanking. You still in uh, any breaking of commandments that our children's do automatic. You get in the rod of correction. Plus, we're taking whatever our treats or whatever tablets, TV, whatever your toys, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So smoke these kids out. It, it, change the way you discipline these kids and you will get a different result. If you keep telling them don't do that or you keep lecturing or you keep yelling at them and they keep doing the same thing. How many times I got to tell you clean your room? Quit telling them and spank them, and then they're going to clean their room. That's your problem. You keep telling them instead of actually putting actions with that. You, How many times I'm going to give you a spanking, and you said that three times, and you've never given them a spanking. Then once you say, oh, that's just mom just talking. That's just dad just talking. You know what I'm saying? Let your yays be yays. If you do that again, I'm going to give you spanking and give them their spanking or take that away. Really push that. If kids are stressing you out, that's the leadership. Attitude and behavior in a team reflects the leadership, reflects the coach, reflects the team leader. That is poor leadership. And yeah, you can say, oh, you know, kids are disobedient. Some kids are better. If they trained adults to be slaves and to not run away and to be scared of a slave master, that is an adult, a, a black Hebrew man that can easily knock out this white master. But so much fear and they've been whipped and they've been trained and they've been tortured to the point to where they do not want to run away. And you telling me you can't discipline a six year old, an eight year old, a 10 year old. But these Europeans were able to enslave adults. You mean to tell me you cannot discipline and get these children in order. 
but they were able to do it to grown men. I'm a grown, I could easily knock this white slave master out right now, but I won't do it. Why? Because they train these slaves. So don't tell me you can't get these kids in order. That's a reflection of leadership, not on the kids. That's leadership. Same thing with marriage. That's a man's leadership. That reflection on a man's leadership. Don't, don't, don't give me that. Everyone needs to take account for their action. So if kids are stressing you out, if it's because they're disobedient, change the way you just dis- like my son's old. They're like, oh, you know, you keep slamming the door, son. Don't even worry about it. And now guess what? You're going to open this door and shut it. You're going to do it 50 times. You're going to walk outside, come out, go in the bathroom, open it, shut it. And, and he'll be there 30 minutes just opening and shutting the door. Oh, oh, you don't want to clean up the syrup that you left on the outside or you don't uh, do it a hundred times. Not even right standards. Do it a hundred times. So he's sitting there for 30 minutes, cleaning the thing, putting the syrup, taking the syrup, up, pouring it, putting that. And I'll have them. I'll have. Oh, you don't want to do that. Get in the bed and get out of the bed 15 times. Have them do a repetition, just like how you write standards. Have them do that. Oh, you don't want to sweep the floor, son, right? You're going to be sweeping. Sweep it again. Sweep it again. Sweep it again. I do a rule like, hey, if you tell me you're done sweeping and I find three things on the floor, you're going to sweep it again. And now you're sweeping the living room. Now you're going to be sweeping outside. You'll be sweeping for eight hours straight if you don't want to get it right. Have them do it in repetition. Change the way you discipline your kids and that I guarantee you they will not stress you out. Solve the problem and don't deal with the problem. Kids really shouldn't stress you out to the point to where you snap on them. Because if you're disciplining them right, then it should be somewhat smooth. I'll say that. They still going to stress you out. They just kids. They're going to draw on some wall. They're going to write on something. They're going to throw a rock at a car or something. They're going to do some. Kids are dumb. They're going to do some dumb stuff. Kids are kids. That's their knowledge. It's, why'd you do that? I don't know. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. That's how I was when I was 16. So why would it? Th- we thought it was a good idea to throw rocks off the bridge onto the freeway at cars. We thought, yeah, that would be funny in our mind, but us causing an accident and could cause a potential death. That doesn't go through a 16 or 14 or 12 year old mind. The the repercussions are the cause and reaction behind that in their mind. Man, that would be funny. That would be a good idea. Ha, <laughs> they're going to be, you know what I'm saying? So kids are just dumb and you just got to deal with it. It says the rod gets the foolishness. Kids, the, the heart of a kid is foolishness, but the rod shall beat it out of them. This is what the scripture says. So dealing with stress on that mindset, change the way you discipline them so they don't stress you out. What's another one? Obviously, you know, prayer, but prayer, faith without works is dead being alone. Let me check out some of these things you guys are saying right now. All right. OK, we got get back on the slide. I don't get that. Get back on the slide. You go into the park more. All right. Cool. 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 Parents. Yes, we do. All right. Cool. Read some of that stuff. All right. So let's deal with uh job. Let's deal with job. All right. So. Or uh, uh, dealing with the job, say you do not like your job or you do not like your situation on the job, because this is a lot of stress, too, is people on the job where their haters or the manager don't like you or they could be prejudiced. Who knows? You know, they bring someone in and they get the promotion when you've been there and you should have been got the promotion and they hire someone instead of bring you up. Oh, you're say you're good at this position. And instead of training someone else at their position, it's easier to just hire someone in an upper position that pays more and keep you in that position because you you're a good employee. And sometimes that happens. You get punished for being a good employee and taking due diligence. So you could be stressed out like, dude, how's this guy get this position? He's just knew they hired him. And I've been worked from the ground up. And then uh, when this manager quit, I've ran both positions. And then I should essentially get this position because I've been doing this position for two months and then they find someone and give them that position. I stay down here. Now, imagine coming to work every day and seeing that happen. That is a, a stress that you could deal with that and be at that company in resentment or find another job. Ask for a raise. Like solve that. Get that stress off. Put the satisfaction of saying, here's my two week notice. You know, Harriet, right when you see the day you see that that happened, they pretty much gave you the middle finger. So. 
right there, you know, you have no future. They do not care about you. They don't care if you could feed your family more with this pay raise. They don't care if you're struggling. They don't care if you're right around the corner from eviction. They don't care if you don't have gas in your tank. Apparently they don't, because if they did, they would have put you in that position and they didn't. And I'm using this as a scenario. So since these companies don't care about you, I don't have loyalty to any company. My loyalty is to the most high, to the sense of most high, to my family. It's whatever. I don't, at the end of the day, they chase their dollar. So I'm here to get my dollars and be gone. That's it. I don't, there, uh, there's few companies, mom and pop shops, there's probably loyalty and they care about you and whatnot and they'll help you out. But the majority of these bigger franchises, don't even worry. Get your chips and get gone. Who cares? Who Half the time, who even cares about that two-week notice? Here, here's a three-day notice. Oh, man, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Bam, just bounce. Who cares? You know what I'm saying? As long as you have that other job before you quit that job, you already use them as a reference and then bounce and then you're at the other job and then bounce. Forget these people. These people don't care because they don't give you a two-week notice. Don't, they're, don't have loyalty. Get your money and get gone. Have, it, you people listening need to be out of Babylon anyways. So find another job. Get your two week notice and have that satisfaction, man. Here's my two week notice. What? Oh, well, you're, you know, we really need you. This and this is like, man, I, and you could tell them I should have got that position. You have me work that, that position until you found someone else. So, you know, I'm capable of doing it. Why'd you hire someone else and kept me down here? I could use that extra money to take care of my family. You know, get, get to tell them what's on your mind off the jump, bam, and then bounce. And you'll have so much stress and you leave in a position of power. You leave in a position of self-respect and dignity, like find another job, go out there. Some of you people, Hey, do what you need to do. Don't be stressed with people on the job, make your complaint or talk to that person individual. If you feel it's going to be worse because you're dealing with sinners, find another job. It is better for you seek peace and holiness without which no man can see the almighty without it is in you be at peace with all men. If these people don't want to be at peace with you, not only is peace for them, but peace within yourself because it's unnecessary stress. And this is why I'm tying into good years. Tomorrow's going to be called good years. This is unnecessary stress. You don't need like, why would you have to go work 40 hours and be in a stressful environment? 40 hours of your life. They're taken from you. And you got to be stressed out or you got to be the uh, the stepping stone. We'll just step everyone over you. You're just the stepping stone. You'll stay down here and be broke while we elevate everyone else. Nah, forget that bounce. Go find another job. Go to night school. Do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, we, we're we saints of the most high. We're not beggars. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or see beggars beg. We need to have self-respect within ourselves. These people will never respect us until we respect ourselves. The one thing that why people respect us, regardless if they have money, is because they know that oh, even though they fear us and whatnot, are they're uh, they think we're violent. But because they think they're violent, they don't run their mouth because we'll take their jaw and they'll be eating through a straw for the next two weeks. They know if they say something in the wrong place, and they have to think like, if I say this right now and I call this dude a nigger. I won't be able to call and get the cops here fast enough before this dude knock me out. So let me just keep my mouth shut. And that's how they think. But when they're in a public place, they be yapping all oh, this and this, that and that, this and this, this and this and this and this and this and this. Because they know uh, there's people watching. Uh, I'll get the cops here. You get arrested. And they play that game. But they know you're going to respect yourself so they don't say nothing to you. And if you're not going to respect yourself and bounce on these people, if you're not going to respect yourself and voice what's right, then a, you know, they're not going to respect you. They're going to think you're a docile. You, we just step right over you. They're going to treat you like a stepping stone. Nah, uh, keep it pushing. Hey, don't be stressed out by these jobs. Forget the, the that 99% of these people are sinners. Any 99.99 are sinners anyway. So man, I'm not prejudiced. I'm prejudiced against sin, but I have no remorse or regard for sinners. If you don't serve the most high, I could care less about your company. You hire me because I make you money. I'm working there because you give me money. That is our relationship. I don't need no loyalty to you. I don't need to know how your kids are doing because you don't care how my kids are doing. You don't care how much food is in my refrigerator. And I know your refrigerator is full of food. I know you go on vacation two, three times a year and I don't. So uh, kick rocks when it's time to, oh, you ain't treating me right. Then I'm gone. And, and that's the mindset we need to have. We need to have self-respect and dignity. Because if not, you're going to put an unnecessary stress on you, which could roll over till you get off of work and you snapping on your kids or you snapping on your husband or you snapping on your wife unnecessarily because you're dealing with the stress for 40 hours a day. And on the flip side, the wife's got to understand, A, or the husband got to understand, A, they're dealing with stress. But hey, if you're not going to solve the problem and just deal with the problem, 
then that's self-inflicted. That's self-inflicted stress. That stress you can get off your prey. You're wasting prayers to the most high because you're putting your faith, but no works to your faith. It is, takes more energy to find another job than for you to just deal with the stress and keep that job. And that's the problem why people deal with it. They're overweight and they're obese and they got, they're going to get heart problems and they can't get a gastric bypass until they lose a certain amount of weight or they're going to die early. For them, it is more work for them to exercise and lose 300 pounds for them to get their gastric bypass operation than for them to just live and stay and keep eating six, 7,000 calories a day and just live in remorse and regret and feel sad for yourself because you're never going to get married or you can't get out of bed or whatnot. How about you just put physical stress on the body versus mental stress and get going? How about you put physical stress and by looking for uh, putting applications and finding another job, then that mental stress we're dealing with people that don't care about you. It's like, get gone. Let me see some comments on the stress on the jobs. Make sure you good, you're a good employee and that you're using righteous judgment and when evaluating whether or not you deserve that position. Yes, this is true. Katura, what she says is true. All right. Um, burn them. Yep. Devils are 80 hours a week. Some of you guys are doing 80 hours a week solution. Yeah, we got to be able to find solutions. Like I said, tomorrow will be uh, your good years and then tomorrow will be an overcomer. So this kind of ties in with being an overcomer. So I'm not going to get too much into that, but I'm dealing with the children, the job. We're going to deal with money right now because these are the main things that stress people out. And like I said, there's no concrete scripture that could be like, all right, when dealing with the bad person on the job, because some of these scriptures don't apply because they're sinners. It says, if you have all against your brother, it says my mother and brother are those who do the will of my father. These people are sinners on the job site. So I don't have to come with them, talk to them by myself or bring two people. Well, I'm going to bring the whole true Hebrews United congregation to deal with this sinner on the job site. And if he don't hear you, bring the church. And then he's a vagabond. He's a sinner that those scriptures don't even apply to this sinner. They apply to brothers in the body. And so dealing with these situations, there's no concrete scripture, but we use the entirety of the Bible. Like I deal with marriage and reconcile and taking them back if they cheat. The entirety of the Bible to deal with these scenarios. So let's keep going. Money. If you're financially strapped, you have this problem of you do not make enough money. Your debt to income ratio is too high. And or you do not have enough money to save. If you cannot save a hundred dollars, and this is low, a hundred dollars a paycheck. And if you get paid every two weeks, if you cannot save two hundred dollars a paycheck, if you're bi weekly, then you are in a bad position. And I'm talking about after credit cards and car payments and all this. This means you are not getting ahead in life. You are wasting months because you can't even save. That means you don't have a surplus of money for an emergency, for a car breaking down. If you got to run straight to a credit card to take care of a transmission or whatnot, you are in a bad place. And so that is a, a problem that will always be on you every month, two years, three years, four years, living paycheck to paycheck. And that stress will affect your marriage, will affect your kids. There's things like I want to buy. It's called KiwiCo. It's like scientific and uh, arts and uh, uh, scientific science, arts and uh, engineering projects. They send you every month and it costs roughly like 50 bucks. And it educates your kids and gets their brain to think outside the normal math, English, reading, writing, and all that stuff. Right. And it's, you know, it challenges them, you know, and it's age appropriate. I'm going to get this stuff sent out. But what if I didn't have the money to do that? What if I didn't have the money to take my kids to the zoo or to a wild animal park or, or, or to a museum to expand their mind and, and to stimulate those brain cells and look at the world in a different light and not just in the house or going to the park? What if you don't have the money for that? There's a lot of things that your kid gets deprived educational wise. You can't send them to college. You can't get them a car. You can't do this. You can't do that because of money. And so money is a huge stress factor. They said most of marriage divorces, this is sinners though, divorces is because of um, money, you know, financial stress. Uh, two is, you know, I, I guess we don't have no statistics about people's marriage in truth. I do find that our divorce rate is high because a lot of Hebrews, not they're not in truth, think that sex is marriage and they it, marry and divorce is so easy and 
all this foolishness on the Facebook. These people are just garbage. But we'll do with that another day. So find a better job. Take the time, find a better job. Take the time, get a second job. Take the time, go to school. Right now is a perfect opportunity to go to school because a lot of them are online. A lot of them is online. And with this financial debt relief they got for student loans and stuff that they're giving out, some of you guys could get what you need. It don't have to be a degree to apply for a better job because it's online. Some of you Hebrews, especially with this Black Lives Matter movement, you could get the job just for being black. I mean, really? Like, come on now. Like, really? Like, you go to the interview and you say, all you got to do is say Black Lives Matter. When you shake their hand, you probably got the job. Or you got to say, yeah, man, I appreciate you giving me this opportunity for this interview because most people discriminate against Hebrews or black people simply because they're colored. But you seem like that person that doesn't do that. And they'll hire you. Could just, I, you there's many ways you could play this game. Like we have the Corona and online learning, which now people are taking online degree. Kids are going to school online. You got the whole uh, oversensitive um uh, people with black lives. So people are hiring black people in this and we're supporting this and everyone's into supporting black people right now. You have an opportunity to like get out of your problem dealing with money. You have an opportunity to get the education you need and be on a two year plan. Okay, I'll go to school. Then I'm gonna start handing out resumes. Bam, let's let's roll. Let's write. You know what I'm saying? Some of you guys, uh, 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 they don't watch Facebook. Some of you guys are watching YouTube. You got child care issues. Find a solution to that. That's stressing you out. Find a solution to that. Who I, you know, I want to do this, but I got child care. Who I'm going to do with the watch the kid with every problem. There's a solution. And sometimes the solution takes more energy than just dealing with the problem. But once you get the solution done, then it's way less energy. Once you get the better job, then you don't have to stress living paycheck to paycheck. But going to school for a year and then getting your resume and getting the job takes energy. Yeah, it takes more energy than dealing with it right now. But after that. You'll be at peace because you can't, man, at least be saving a hundred bucks a week. At least, at least, that's at least you should be able to stack some money, stack some money to the side, make progress. You know, do you want when your kid gets 18, they just see you living paycheck to paycheck? But you're saying, son, you could be anything you want to be, anything you put your mind to. In my mind, if I was 18, I'm like, then what did you put? You put your mind to living paycheck to paycheck? This was your dream? This was your ambition? Like that, you had 18 years since I was born to apply yourself, and this is what you accomplished. This is what you've done, and you want to tell me I could be anything I could be. You're a hypocrite, because why didn't you be? And then we're going to deal with overcomers, not to tomorrow, but the day after with that. But hey, apply your, if money is stressing you out, there's a solution to that. Look what's out there. Look what's out there and run with it. Go with it. Find what's out there and apply yourself to it. I'm doing things. Sister Whitney Couture is doing things. Hey, Sister Brit, people at True Hebrews United. I got Brother Vince doing some things. Hey, people out there is applying themselves and striving every year, especially you men out there. You should be trying to be better. If not a better husband, better father. If not trying to make more money, there should be increase in your leadership and your manliness every year. Every year. It shouldn't be stagnant. It shouldn't be the same. You women out there, you're in the same boat. You, it, read the virtuous woman. She was applying. She found a land that was good. She applied her hand to the spindle. She didn't have idle hands. Just because you're a stay-at-home wife do not does not mean you can't find a job. There's jobs online where all you do is become a customer. Sir. Um, I know a brother. His wife just does assurance claims. People get hurt on the job. They call her, and she just plugs in the assurance claim. That's all she does. There's people online that just calls people, not tell a marketer and calls people and see if they want to uh, uh, switch to a different uh, thing. They're not even telling not in commission if they want to lower their electrical bill. There's things you could do over the phone. There's jobs you could work online. I've seen this one lady we were witness to. She worked on Amazon just asking her customer service from home. She was only making 15 bucks an hour. I mean, that's pretty good depending on your state. But if you're a stay-at-home mom making zero money or making little money and you could just work for while you're watching the kids or whatever, why not do it? The kids are asleep, work at night, whatever. Figure it out. If money stresses you out, find a solution to that problem. Like quit dealing with the problem and solve the problem. I had to, it took a while for us to get true Hebrews United in that mindset. I'm like, 
the toilet seat's broke. And I was like, so are we going to wait until our kid falls in the toilet seat and drown before you guys fix that toilet seat? Are you guys going to keep just dealing with that problem of the toilet seat just all slippery and slidey because there's two toilets at the church house. There's two bathrooms. And then they thought about like, yeah, man, that's true. Why we got to wait until an accident happens before we fix this? We could just saw. And they went, they bought it, they fixed it super quick. And that's the thing. A water dispenser cord got broke. They solved it. They fixed it. They Bam. Watch a YouTube video. Bam. You know, like solve the issues. I cannot stress enough that you could get the stress off yourself by just solving the problem. Take the stress off your plate. All right, let's deal with marriage. Ho, ho, ho. So, you know, I deal with children. We dealt with jobs. We dealt with money. We deal with marriage. The reason why I deal with these four things is because these are like the four things that stress people out. There's other stresses out there, but these are like the main ones. All right. So unbelieving spouse, believing spouse, unbelieving, regardless, the marriage is not what you want. You don't imagine living your life uh, and spending years, which I'm going to try to stay. I'm going to scratch the surface on this. I'm just dealing with solving, uh, problem solving, because we're going to deal with good years tomorrow. So the future is not looking nice in this current situation. I'll say that. So some solutions, obviously, you know, it's prayer is uh, counseling. I find the problem with counseling is most men have too much pride to seek counseling. And this is why they live in, they uh, are self-afflicted. They, men have this problem of having so much pride that they will, it's almost like they have a ship, right? And they're the captain. And you're like, hey man, we need to abandon ship. Man, this this ship's not meant for the storm. We need to just abandon. Let's just go here. But they have so much pride and say, hey, let's get help from that other ship. That other ship is he's a captain, too. He's been selling these same seas. Let's get help. From, and they're like, no. And they will rather have their ship or their marriage sink than to humble themselves and go to another captain and say, hey, man, I need help. And and the problem with that is. If you go to that other captain, you might find out that that captain got help from another captain to help his marriage. He made a went to someone else and said, hey, man, I need help. And you have to understand that me as a minister, Teacher Simon. There are thousands of men out there that has more knowledge on marriage than me. And there's things in, that they could point out to say, hey, this could help. This could help. And I got to be humble enough to say, hey, man, you've been married this many amount of years or you've been married less than me. But these principles you adopted that I didn't get because my dad was never there. He was a truck driver. He's always gone. He never showed me how to be a good husband. So they have this pride and they will rather have their marriage crash and burn than to seek help and have a beautiful marriage. And that's the sad thing. So I say counseling, but the likelihood that I've seen with Hebrews. This is why Hebrews don't join congregation. Hebrew men is because they, oh, I don't need no man teaching me, but you don't even know how to keep the Sabbath properly. I don't need no, you don't even know what adultery is. You rocking a six point star like these false uh, synagogues say, and I don't need no man in this and this. And they have that pride and they will rather burn up their own chance of salvation and go to the lake of fire than to say, Hey man, I'm a sheep and I need a shepherd period. And so, Counseling is one way to solve that. Prayer, you guys could pray together. I noticed that if you have an unbeliever or you have a husband that's just in the flesh, and I'm referring to you might have a, a husband or a wife that say they believe, but they indulge themselves in Netflix, they indulge themselves in Facebook, they indulge themselves with uh, unequally yoked people, they indulge themselves in fleshly things, and they don't indulge themselves in reading and praying and fasting and fellowship with brothers and sisters, then they're fleshly. Even though they may be keeping some of the commandments or whatnot. So when you say, hey, let's pray together, it's they either don't want to or it's super short. And even if they do, the Almighty's not even hearing their prayer because you're not going to indulge in the flesh all day and then come to me. I always saw Almighty like, nothing, like, man, you just spend six hours. You haven't read all day. You spend six hours on Netflix. You watch the football game. You play video Call of Duty. And then now you want to just do this little five minute prayer, man. Get that out of here. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a dog. I'm not a peasant. You don't, I don't just get your leftovers. Forget you. You know, I mean, I'm assuming, 
you know, the Almighty's like that from the scriptures I taught on that. You know, you're not going to give him the crumbs of your day and think he's going to accept. It. He says, I'm a great king. Uh, let me read some comments because I went into marriage. Uh, it is not for the man neither. We are out dealing with the world and then have to come home and deal with the family. This is true. I agree. All these people have to teach their kids and try to work uh, from home and learning the same things. Kids are a job in themselves and stay at home. Mom who will work is having two jobs. This is true as well. The ones that have to do it now because uh, of COVID. Yes. All you guys said some true statements, especially you men out there. You guys deal with the world and have to come home. It's sad. I have a brother out there uh, in the Almighty. When I say brother, that's a baptized brother, not just a Hebrew. But uh, his wife, you know, don't really respect the commandments and let their kids do things that break the commandments. And so when he's coming home, takes off his armor, like, oh, I'm home. And then he's dealing with the wife. Let me put the helmet back on. Let me put the armor. Let me get the sword because I can't get no peace. I'm dealing with sinners outside and I come home and I deal with sinners inside. So he never gets to take off his helmet of salvation. He never gets to take off his breastplate of righteousness and just chill in his house in peace, chill in his kingdom and be at rest. It's always if I'm not fighting with sinners, I'm fighting with family. And, and I, I feel them. I happen to not have to be in that situation. I mean, I have it in my heart. I'd rather be on my own than settle with the sinner. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I, that's just me. I never had to be put in that position. Praise the Almighty. Maybe because I teach the gospel or something, the Almighty's not letting certain things hit me or whatnot. I don't know. But my standard was uh, firm when I started dating, and um, and that's how I am. Uh, it says uh, it's better to be in a corner on a rooftop than be in a house with a contentious woman and uh, and or a man. And that's saying it's better to be on a corner housetop with peace. Than to be in a wide house with a contentious person. We'll just say that in general. It's better to have a handful of meal than to be a well furnished table where contentious and strife is. Another scripture says, I'd rather just be eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich than to have a whole feast and then there's fighting and debate. I'd rather just stay here and be at peace. And that's what he's saying. Seek peace. Those are the two scriptures I brought to support what I'm talking about. It's better to take a, a loss in one area. That doesn't outweigh the peace that you will get. And that's how marriage is. So another one is, uh, I think I said pray together, but uh, separation, separation. Now, I'm all about marriages and I'm anti-divorce. I'm real. I believe you should work that out. Uh, if you have to separate and reconcile, I believe in that. Uh, I believe you made your choice and you need to live with it. A, you know, and whatever age you made it, whether you got married at 18, 20, you made a covenant and the almighty made a covenant. And he said, you know, oh, that there were some way for a man that could go on to them. He was so upset that they brought idols in his temple. They brought idols in his temple and they took things from the temple and offered it to false gods. They were worshiping false gods in his temple. They gave him the most middle finger of the middle fingers you could possibly give. And he divorced them. And he told Ezekiel, I could go and sing you to the Gentiles and they'll believe you. But no, I'm sending you to your own people and they're not going to believe you. This is why Yeshua says, if if I had came to Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented and that city would have stood to this day. But I come to you and you don't believe me. He's saying, man, if anyone has the right to quit on his marriage, it's the most high. If anyone has any right to quit on his marriage just the most high just think about it he destroyed these sinners sodom and gomorrah he destroyed them and he says woe unto you it says sodom and gomorrah will rise up in this generation and condemn you because if i would have came to them they would have repented in that city i'm talking about 2000 and what they call 2020 there still would have been a sodom and gomorrah to today because if Christ would have came to these Gentiles, but did he go to the Gentiles? He reconciled to his own people. He reconciled to his own people. And so I am super against divorce. Unless you commit things worthy of divorce and put in a way then no, I, I am against that. A, if your marriage sucks, then that's a reflection on your leadership. I cannot control what my wife does, nor can you control what your husband does. But if if a husband had everything together and their and their wife had a gambling problem, a drug problem, a lying problem, 
a, a verbally abusive problem. You can't control that. That's something. But if it's a problem because of your behavior and your marriage ain't where you wanted to be, that's a reflection on your leadership. That's a reflection on your leadership. If your kids are disobedient, is that the kid's fault? No, that's the parent's fault. When you see kids in the grocery store acting up, do you ever say it's those kids? Or what do you say? Man, those parents do not what? Discipline those kids. So when you have a marriage, you men out there, you have a marriage and it's not up to par, don't say, oh, that's because of uh, uh, your leadership. That's your leadership. Because I have found few women that you give them flowers, you take them out, you give them massages, you treat them right, you compliment them, and your marriage is in shambles. Yep, your marriage just sucks. There's some women out there, gold diggers and stuff, yes. But if you're serving the Almighty, you should uh, filter that before you marry them, I will hope. And some of you guys, maybe you guys, she played the part real good, acted like she wasn't a gold digger. Yes, there's some wolves in sheep clothing, and they'll play the part like they believe the most high. That's few. Most of the time, especially you brothers, we could spot a gold digger just like we could spot a thought. We could spot a hoe. I know by a conversation if I could sleep with a girl the same day. Just by having a conversation with her. I know uh, she'll probably take a week. And this one will probably take a couple months. I know this. Just like I know a gold digger when I see one. So you Hebrews out there. And you're marrying because she got some hips and some butts. And she be looking clean. And you just got married. And she flip went flip mode like Busta Rhymes on you. Hey. That's a few small percentage. But the majority of you guys married some decent women. And all you got to do is just treat them right. And show them some love. And then you can fix. All you got to do is work on your own personal characteristic flaws instead of being prideful and act like you got your stuff together when you don't. How you get like. There's people that say they believe on the job site and then they be cussing. They're all oh, excuse me. Like, dude, how do you say you believe, but you cussing? It says, hey, if any man claim to be religious and bridal, a bridal is what you put on a horse's mouth to steer it and bridal, if not his tongue, he deceives his own self. His religion is in brain. So you got people saying they believe cussing. They believe you watching these movies you shouldn't have. You're fleshly minded and you're going to think you're not going to work your marriage out in the flesh. You're really dealing with your marriage in the spirit. You're really dealing with your marriage according to the scriptures. And then guess what? It's always the wife's fault. And I'm not. There are bad wives out there and there are wives that have characteristic flaws. I believe that 100 percent. But from my experience. The man could dictate the progress of this marriage and the man could either put push love and joy and peace into his marriage or he could say, I don't care. And I push this in the marriage. But when I've cared, when I had a I don't care mindset, it never profit my marriage or never profited other people or never profited me. It empowers you by saying, man, I don't even care. You feel power. You feel strong. I don't even care, man, whatever, whatever she says, I don't care, I don't care, this and this, this and this, and you feel empowered, but all you're doing is crushing people because the Almighty cares for people, the Almighty loves people, the Almighty does care, this is why he chastised them, because he cared, and that's what we men have to get, I know I'm ranting today, I'm, I got one more scripture to give, but I'm trying to deal with you guys, so we have to care, and you have to take away that power, that false power, that false belief of saying, I don't care. And you really do. Or, and if you don't, you need to start. And that every time I've cared and pushed love and peace in my marriage or my relationship with my son or relationship with people, only positive came out of it. Only positive came out of it. And that's the mindset of you men and your marriage. Hey, so back to the solution of separation. Let's go ahead and get uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read some of this as we get the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to start at verse 9. All right. I don't even like peanut butter and jelly, but I'll eat that instead of being in the table of contentious. She may have just wanted you till she could make room for someone else. This is true. Hey, I'm telling there's some there's some bad women out there. There's some bad women out there. Maybe she just didn't want you to leave her. So she pretended to love you until she could stick you and get you with a kid. huh? Put the joke over there. Hey, there, there are some women that just they just they 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 are narcissists. They're all about themselves. And just the fact that you want to leave her. She'll try to stick you with the kid because who are you to leave me? I leave you. There's there is bad women out there like. Caleb said, there's some bad women out there. 
I will hope, especially you Hebrews, that you've been around, you know the game, and you know women's behavior. I know some of us has been sheltered and not that much experience with women to where we can't tell. And not that we want to be naive, but that we look in the best of everyone. And so you think that they're caring and they love you. And these women are really grimy. And once they get you, then they let their self go and whatnot. So, um, and they go flip mode on you. I, I agree. But on the flip part, if you, this is why I say separation, um, as, as, as a reason to solve that stress, because if you separate from her, then you're going to be at peace and it is better. First Corinthians chapter seven. I'll read the scripture. Then we'll deal with that. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse nine. But if they can't contain, let them marry for it's better than married to burn. He's telling about fornication. It says it's good for a man to not even touch a woman. If you are dating, you shouldn't be holding hands. You shouldn't be hugging. You shouldn't be kissing. You shouldn't be snuggling. If you you don't touch a woman until you're married, period. That solves that problem. You know, that solves that problem. If you're struggling in the flesh and you have this sexual stress on you, it says go ahead and get married. It's better than married in the burn. Find you someone that you're compatible with. It only takes around six or eight months to know if you're compatible. What's your thoughts on disciplining? Let me see if you're really serving the Almighty. Let me see what your car and your house look like. Are you nasty? How often do you wash the dishes? How, how do you budget your money? You know and I'm saying you women out there, look at his leadership. What is your goals? What is your ambitions? Do you say you're going to do something you really follow through? Just be observing certain things. Maybe I could just name this stuff for what women need to look at and what men need to look at to know, you know, what his future is projected or what he has, that, what's his stronger weak points. And you just make a graph whether he's successful or not or something. So anyways, so it's better than married than burn. And unto the married, I command yet not I, but the almighty, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away. So he's saying uh, he, he I'm just like me, I'm against uh, divorce or even separation. But there's times where uh, husbands verbally, a husband or a wife, let's say a person's verbally abusive. Maybe they have a drug problem. Maybe you have a gambling problem. They didn't commit adultery. So you can't go get another one. But it's better for you to separate. And like it, the scripture was saying, it's better to dwell on the corner of a huge housetop than a white house with a contentious woman or a man and whatnot. So we're supposed to seek peace. And we're going to finish the scripture and it deals with peace. If you were in a relationship and all it is is bitterness and resentment and frustration, don't stay in there for the kids. I find when you see these old people that are bitter and you ask them questions on the job and they talked about their old relationships with their wife and this and that and how they were doors three times. And they have trust and whatnot. When you're in this environment and you're in a stressful frustration environment, you become dark and dim and your your view of the world is not colorful. It becomes less and less colorful and then pretty much it comes gray like watching the black and white TV and you see them. And you're like, dude, have you just be honest, look at a person that's been married in a miserable marriage for 10 or 15 years and look how they are. They barely smile. A kid could come and do something cute in them. Hand. You know, there's they don't find joy in anything. Uh, that's probably this and this. Anything's got to be negative. Like I said, this one guy, I was like, man, you your glass is half empty for you. I'm like, what does that mean? This and this and this. I was like, check this out because he likes dogs. It's like we could see a. Uh, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? A group of dogs, a little puppies, a litter. There you go. A litter of dogs. And you see this runt and he's trying to wrestle with the bigger dogs and he's trying his best, but he's getting tossed everywhere and he can't run as fast. You'll come and say, man, look at that little runt, man. He can't run. He can't wrestle. He's getting tossed around. Look at that runt. I'll come like, man, that little dog got hard. I'll take that dog. Man, that dog got hard. Even though he's small, he's still trying to hold his own. Let me get that dog. And that's the difference. I look at the world as being bright and colorful and people look at it as being dark and gray. And when you're miserable in a marriage or on the job all the time, arguing, stress, this, that, tears, all this depression, there's no way you're going to snap out of that. It's going to take you a while. And you're not going to snap out of it in the stressful situation. You have to put yourself out of that situation so you could be that bright person you could be that colorful you see how kids when they're in high school they joke around and they're colorful they're full of enthusiasm they're looking forward to the future you should supposed to be that that same way not oh, man the world sucks it's man it's oh man no dude no 
if you have to separate, do what you need to do. You need to weigh out your options. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be a single parent or this or that, or I'm going to be by myself. It's being alone with peace outweighing having someone with stress. I'm talking about you men and women out there. You just got to you gotta just weigh your options. Now, let's keep going. I'm going to support this with the scripture. It says, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled. Separating is not necessarily a bad thing because it gives the other party a chance to work on their characteristic flaws, whether it's pride, ego, drinking problem, gambling problem, whatever. And it gives you a chance for you to be a better wife. So when you do reconcile or a better husband, when you do reconcile, you could come back and have an even better marriage. When you guys are in the ring trying to work on your skills, you're in the fight. But maybe you guys got to get out and train up and come back and get back in the fight and fight for your marriage. You men out there, you guys are cowards because you know, I'm down to knuckle up with anyone that calls me out and it says seek peace and holiness and it says be not a brawler. So, no, I don't go out there and try to initiate fights. But if someone's going to start some stuff and I got to defend myself, I'm more than willing. But I need to fight for my marriage, too. E either you're a fighter or not, because I look at it as this. And yes, I came from a gang. And so I have a gang mentality. So I fought hard and I'm willing to do 25 to L for the homies and, you know, doing what I got to do. I ain't going to get in detail. I don't want to get locked up, but I got to do what I got to do. Right. You know what I'm saying? So then when I come to the almighty, I'm fighting hard for the almighty. No, I'm not breaking no sap. If, if I lose my job, I lose my job. If I'm willing to risk 25 to L for the homies to pull, we got to roll up and do some dirt. And then when I come to the almighty, I got, man, I'm doing 25 to L for the most high. It's nothing. You know what I'm saying? It's nothing. Lose a job? I was willing to be in prison for 25 years. What's losing a job for the Sabbath? This is nothing. You know what I'm saying? So then I come to the marriage, and to me, I was like a little coward. It's like, man, I was, oh, man, forget it. Let's just separate all. Oh, I had that I don't care attitude. Man, I don't care, man. Forget it, man. She be doing, I point out her stuff. Didn't want to accept my flaws. Oh, this just seen her flaws. Didn't, didn't want to accept my pride comes in. I don't care and feel like I'm empowered and whatnot. And then it's like, at the end, it's like the almighty showed me, why aren't you fighting for your marriage? Why are you a coward for your marriage? You super hard on the streets, but you super weak in your marriage. And then it's just like, ah, oh, yeah, you're right, almighty. I got to step it up in that area. And then I start pushing love, pushing joy, pushing massages, pushing buying stuff special, pushing time, time that we talk, put in interest, just like we were dating. Hey, you know, start not falling off. Start pushing that stuff in my marriage. And nothing but positive. And no, I'm not saying our marriage is super good because I got some things I want to deal with her on. And when I'm not I'm by any means, I'm saying that. But I'm saying once I push spiritual things, love, peace, joy, happiness, edification. Once I led my marriage by the scriptures and not by my own flesh, then nothing, nothing but good came out of it. That's what I'll say. So let's keep going. It says, uh, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let the husband not put away his wife. Fight for your marriage, pretty much. But the rest speak I, not the Lord. Any brother that has a wife that believeth not, if she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Don't put her away. She's a believer. You came to the Almighty. She doesn't want to believe the Almighty. She's an atheist, Big Bang Theory type woman, whatever. It says, don't put her away. And the woman which have an unbelieving husband uh, uh, that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they're holy, so your children will make it in. That Your spouse may not make it in because they're still unbelieving. They're not going to be sanctified on the salvation, but your kids will make it into the kingdom. It says, but, and if they depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called you to peace. See, it says, don't try to fight. If they're unbelieving and they want to leave because they don't want to keep the Sabbath, and they want to celebrate Christmas, it says, let them. The Almighty has called you to peace. It's better to be separated and be at peace than to try to be at war, trying to fight to keep this marriage. He's saying you don't you're not under bondage because you're not fighting for your marriage. If she doesn't want to keep the Sabbath and keep the feast days and live holy, then let her go. It says you, you called her to be, be at peace with her. Check this out, though. Called you to peace. For what knoweth thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knoweth thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? You may let her go because she don't want to keep it, but she didn't cheat or whatnot. You separate it. And then she may come back around. The Almighty might deal with her heart. And you're more than open arms. Hey, let's come. She's like, you know, I want to go to church with you one day. She'll call out of the blue three months later. Hey, I want to go to service with you. And you're like, what? All right. All right. And you're like, praise the Almighty. And that service turns to another. The next thing you know, she's like, she she wants to eat dinner with the family 
and she stays the night. And you already know you hit it and whatnot. So she stayed one night. Like, All right, praise almighty. Hopefully we work it back. And then she goes home. Then next thing you know, she's staying on the weekends. The next thing you know, bam, you back reconciled. Your marriage is back on track. She was an unbeliever. Now she's an unbeliever. You never know whether you should save your wife or whatnot. So with the stress of the wife, back to the stress of the wife, is a hey, if if that's what you have to do, I don't push. Obviously, I don't push divorce and I don't even push separation. But you might be in a situation where you have to be separated. There is a sister that I give her much props. She ended up marrying within three months. She realized that he, he pulled the bus of rhymes, went flip mode on her, wasn't really serving the almighty. She I personally think she didn't wasn't thorough on her research, especially finding a man. You're trying to find a leader. You got to make the best decision. So um, she ended up leaving him. And she separated and whatnot, and he's probably going to commit adultery because he's led by the flesh. So I don't know why she doesn't. He does. She doesn't just give him a bill of divorcement, but whatever. So she's on her own, but she's at peace. You know, she has other stress. She's by herself and whatnot. But the the peace that she has outweighs the stress of trying to stay with someone that is not interested in the marriage. And that's what I'm saying. These three, these four things: jobs, children, money, and marriage will be the main stressors. Let us lead our marriage by the scriptures. Let us deal with these financial problems by solving them and solving all of our kid problems. Work these things out. So hopefully, I know I ranted this one. I, I hit four scriptures, though. Hopefully, uh, I'm going to read some comments and then we get into this real quick. Uh, all right. Maybe she, this and this list, please. OK, I'll, I'll bring a list of stuff to look for for a husband and stuff to look for for a wife. And questions to ask, and then it's things to observe. So it'll be a list of look things and things to observe, you know. Because especially you wives, you gotta look for a good leader. You gotta see if he says, "Yeah, you know," even something small. Uh, yeah, man, I'm probably gonna um, get the car detailed this weekend, and then they don't all oh, next weekend, and then they don't all oh, next weekend. Something small, like dude, this guy procrastinates. And I'm not saying that's a deal breaker, but you know this in the future. This is something you might have to talk to my. Hey, I know you procrastinate on a lot of stuff. You're saying you're going to start a business, which will help out the family, and then you it, three years later, you oh yeah, I'm going to start. I'm going to like certain things. You, you got to look for a future. He needs to build a, a dynasty, a legacy, a kingdom. He's supposed to be like my goal is to build a house for all of my kids. That is my goal before I die. That all of my kids have a home. They they, they don't have to worry about no mortgage, no rent. They got to go out there and hustle, and I'm not going to spoil them. But because it says great, great people don't produce great kids, they usually spoil them and their kids usually don't amount to much. So I want to make it to where they're going to be great. I'm like, hey, if I built you a house, that means you need to build two houses. Because you with this money you're saving, you should be able to build two houses. You should be able to expand this dynasty. Our name in Belize should be great within two or three generations. Our name should be great. If I produce nothing but champions and go getters, our name should be great. But. Maybe I, I'll, I'll make that list. Maybe I could include that in here. I'm going to start bringing some news. Hey, let me know if you guys want me to start bringing some news. There's some stuff going on. There's some deals being passed. What's going on that affects the saints of the most high. I do that. Uh, give me some feedback on these topics. Yes, I didn't hit as much scriptures, but these are real life things that people got to deal with. And we need to uh, address them. I think this will be healthy. The Feast of Tabernacle, Feast, you know, let's get this stuff together. So tomorrow will be... Uh, your good years is going to be called your good years. I'm not going to ruin it. And then the, after that will be called uh, being an overcomer, you know, so uh, let's get into it. And then after that will be leadership as a man. And then the last day will be a full Sabbath teaching like normal. So with all that said, being done, keep standing. Don't drop standards. Give the almighty hand clap. Shalom. Pertinence. What's pertinence means? P E R T I N. Pertinence. I'm gonna look that up. Pertinence. Pertinence. This is in Spanish. Revelance. Relevancy. Re Revelance. A synonym of pertinence, revelance, apostinence, suitableness, oh, acceptability, proprietary. Oh, that's acceptable. I hit acceptable. All right, that's cool. All right, shalom, guys.